Welcome to Language Surfers Podcast, a space with fresh waves for the mind, dedicated to create a platform where professionals from both language industry and academia can share their professional experiences, and where we also explore different career paths at different stages. In this first episode, I will be interviewing Dr. David Orego Carmona. David is an associate professor in translation at the University of Warwick in the United Kingdom, but he's also a research associate at the University of the Free State in South Africa. David will share with us his professional and academic experience, but he will also disclose how he was able to live and work from three different continents, thanks to being part of the academia. First of all, thank you so much, David, for joining and sharing your experience with us. I'm looking forward to, to hearing your experience and insights. Hi, Anka. No, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. So first of all, I would like to ask you, how did you decide to study languages? Well, that's actually funny because I'm, I'm from Colombia originally, and we don't have or we didn't have at the time a very good uh, foreign language education. So I actually started saying languages very late in life. I started with English when I was 12, 13, I think, and I basically wanted to travel. So I wanted to, I wanted to go abroad and I wanted to, to see other places. So that's, that was the main motivation. And I actually started like seriously studying languages when I was a junior already. So it was rather late in that sense. Yeah, that's great. And uh, what about your PhD? If we have a look at your academic uh, journey, I know that you did a PhD. So when did you decide to do a PhD and how did you decide a topic of what you would like to, to study and research? Sure. So it kind of started naturally, really. I, when I was doing my BA in Colombia, I started working or involving, I became involved in this research group and we were doing some work on audiovisual translation in Colombia and studying subtitling, like self-teaching as subtitling to learn about how to do subtitles, but also how, what you need to consider when you're doing subtitles and what they social impact of subtitles is. So I was doing that along, uh, alongside my studies with other friends. And that's how I learned about research. And I learned that that was uh, a potential career. So I wanted to do a master's after my BA. And then after that, it kind of evolved naturally. I just wanted to continue doing research on subtitling. So I decided to, to stay on that path and then after doing a PhD, then I was basically trying to make a decision whether I wanted to be in academia or look for a job. And finding a job proved very difficult at the time. Uh, and finding, well, finding an academic position was difficult as well. So it was like both uh, markets were very tough at the time. And I was lucky enough to find a postdoc in South Africa. So I was uh, awarded a postdoc position at the University of the Free State. And that motivated me to, to stay in academia and to continue doing research. Okay, so as you as you said that you're from Colombia, but you did your PhD study in, in Spain. Did you have any funding for your PhD or was it on your personal uh, costs? Sure, no. So I was I have I had funding for my PhD. I was awarded a scholarship at the Universitat Rovira Virgil. That's where I did my my masters, and then after the master, I was awarded the grant for the PhD. I did pay for my masters. the The Colombian government has this program of uh, basically loans for you to go abroad and to do a masters or to do your PhD. And funnily enough, at the time, it was cheaper for me to do a master's in Spain and to cover my living expenses for a year in Spain than to afford a master's in Colombia because uh, postgraduate education, even at public universities, is very expensive in Colombia. So it was cheaper to, to go to Spain. And master programs at the time were also more consolidated in Spain. So it was also a motivation for me to, to move abroad. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, I think that it's really interesting, especially for people who, who want to take the step. You know, sometimes it's cheaper in other countries than in your own country, right? 
Sure, many times I don't think you realize how, diff how different university systems, but also the finances behind universities university systems is from a country to another, we tend to assume that, that everything is very standardized when in reality it isn't. So it's worth looking into the different realities and see what's best for you really. Yeah, exactly. And during your PhD, so uh, basically I met David at a CELTRA doctoral summer school. I know that this, especially for me, it was a really helpful At, at that moment, because I was facing uh, methodological issues. So applying to the CETRA summer school was really the solution for myself. In your case, how, how was it to apply to the CETRA school and the funding? How did you, what other options uh, or, you know, ways of handling your PhD did you have to manage? So I was part of a research group as part of my PhD. So I was integrated into the in intercultural studies group at the Universitat Lovi de Virgili. And I had access through that, I had access to some, some funding to go to conferences. My PhD supervisor actually jokes that I won the prize to the most conferences attended during your PhD. So I really took that uh, to heart and used the, the funding. But in particular for the Cetra Summer School, I applied to funding for the um, Uh, European Society of European, sorry, European Society for Translation Studies (EST). They have a summer school grant, and I was awarded that one in 2011 to attend Cetra, and that was really a really good experience because, on the one hand, you get to know all these professors in translation who are very consolidated in their in their field and who are very interested in talking to you, which I found very encouraging, and also other peers, other people working on their topics and that opportunity to discuss with other people who are more or less at, at a, in a similar position as you. I think that was very useful for me and I really encourage everyone to, to take advantage of these experiences and opportunities because it really changes the way how you look at translation and your own research, even if people are working on completely different topics. Yes, exactly. And speaking about the final period of your PhD, you mentioned already that you also have a postdoc. So that was the moment when you had to decide either to join the industry or start your professional uh, uh, journey or continue your professional journey in the academia. Uh, how was it to apply for a postdoc? Was it difficult? Did you also try to have some interviews for the industry? How did you in the end To, how did you take the decision to, to join uh, either the industry or the academia? So I finished my PhD in April 2015 and I had a grant until August 2015. And my perfect plan was to use that time between April and August to find a job. I was invited to many interviews, mainly in the UK, because the university system here is more flexible or used to be more flexible at the time. Uh, but I wasn't successful in actually getting a position. So at some point through that, uh, in, in that time, I decided to start looking for jobs as a professional translator as well. Uh, at the time I was mainly looking into translator jobs. I wasn't looking at anything else because I didn't think I had the, the skills. I think that was a mistake. Uh, looking back into that, I think there are other roles that you could apply for and for which people with a PhD in translation have appropriate skills and is probably suitable for the role. So I would actually encourage people to look more broadly than that. Um, so it, it was proven really tough to find a job. And I was so offered the opportunity to go to Warsaw to work with Agnieszka Sharkovska. Uh, to do some research and to prepare a postdoc application. Because that's the other thing, when you finish your PhD, you realize that applying for postdocs is also a very demanding uh, task. You have many different forms that you need to complete. You need to write different project proposals. You need to apply to different organizations and different uh, funding sources. So it, it does take time. And I was very grateful to have that opportunity to work with someone to really focus on a project. And while I was there, I applied for different postdoc positions, including the one I got to, to go to South Africa. So I think it wasn't 
At the time, I was considering all options, both studying academia or going into the industry. And the opportunity to go to South Africa came up, and that was the one that materialized first. And it seemed like a very good opportunity at the time. And I really enjoyed it, actually. I think that really broadened my perspectives and my views on translation. I'm very happy I got to do that. I think now, if I were to look for a job in the industry, I, I, I now have more information and I would encourage people to, as I said, uh, look into different resources and talk to more people to see how to present yourself differently. Because I think that was one of my mistakes in a way. I really didn't profile, didn't really do much of the preparing my CV for, for the industry or talking to people uh, in the industry. And I think that could be an advantage. Yes, exactly. Uh, adapting the the curriculum to the profile of the job title you are applying. Yeah, exactly. And be aware of the different types of roles available. I'm reaching out to people, just talking to people and asking questions. I think that I, I was really good at networking in academia, but I think I didn't there doing that in the industry. And I think that would have benefited me greatly. I, I know that now, I guess. Obviously, that's it's easier as an afterthought, but that's exactly. life. Yes, exactly. Networking is important in, in every field. So I think that's that's one of the key takeaways from, from this conversation. And if we talk now a bit about the recruitment process, I think that most of the maybe students, graduate uh, recently graduate students or people already in the industry, are quite familiar with how the recruitment process looks like in the industry. But I think it's really interesting, you know, to to change the focus and see uh, how the recruitment process occurs in the university. How is it when you decide that you want to, you know, to um, pursue your career in the academia? What are the steps? What are the requirements? How is a recruitment or an interview? How, how is it? Sure. So I think for every position in the UK, you will find a job description and a list of um, requirements. Some of them are mandatory and some of them, them are optional. I think the first thing we need to mention here is that whenever you apply for a position in the UK, there are probably another 40 or 50 people applying for the same position. And in that group, probably five or six do meet all the basic essential requirements. Uh, and some of the additional requirements that include obviously publications research really is really important when you're applying for an academic position in the uk we have the research excellence framework ref so all universities are assessed based on their research outputs every four or five years and then all universities are interested in hiring people who have the potential to contribute to this uh, research assessment uh, framework so as an early career academic, it's very important to recognize that you will need to tick those boxes. So you will need publications in international journals with impact factor. That also includes uh, impact case studies. So if there, you, you need to ensure that your research has a social impact, it, it can have it, impact has many different interpretations. So I would encourage people who are considering this to read more into, into REF. When I was applying for positions in the UK, I think I didn't know enough. And I think having had a conversation, a, a quick chat with someone in the UK would have benefited me greatly because there are many things that you don't know if you're not part of the system. And there's a lot of this hidden curriculum in a way that you need to become familiar with if you're going to ensure that you uh, get a position. Also, the requirements change a lot even through the recruitment process because many changes in the department will change the, their main focus or their main interest. So it's very important to understand that if you don't get the position, it's not necessarily uh, any judgment on you as a person, but uh, an issue of how your profile and your expertise aligns with the department and what the department wants. So there's a lot there that happens that is not really related to you as a candidate, but more mostly related to the needs of the department. So I would encourage people applying for jobs here to take a close look at the departments, to see information about who's involved in the department, what type of strategies they have, or universities will have information on the strategies. 
also uh, something that I didn't know at the time. Uh, I did most of my interviews at the time via Skype. It was uh, 2015, 2016. So it was a very different world. Now we're used to Teams and Zoom and all that, but back then it wasn't so common. But interviews in the UK, if you are invited to go on campus, for instance, would normally include also a lunch where you have to interact with other members of staff from the department, and in some cases, even other candidates for the position. And that is part of the interviewing process. So do approach uh, people in the department to ask informal questions about how the interview process is, and do talk to other people in the, at the university or even in the system to see, to try to learn more about the dynamics. Because for instance, that lunch with the staff uh, from the university will be part of your interviewing assessment. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think that this is, this, this can be something different from country to country. Uh, yeah, how absolutely. Are conducted. But as you well say, I think that the, the main important thing here is to, to connect with people that have already gone through such a similar process, that already have a position, most probably even at the university you, you want to apply. So once again, networking is, is a relevant factor to take into account. Yeah, that, that was really interesting. And thanks a lot for sharing from your experience. And if we go a bit further into the recruitment process, uh, and if we compare the academia with the industry, you know, some professionals in the industry change the company every two, three or five, 10 years. How is it in the academia? How is how easy it is to change and, you know, apply to another um, position in a different uh, university or a different country? Is it common? Uh, would you change, uh, I don't know, based on the, on the conditions or just because you want to advance? Can you explain a bit this part from, from the academia perspective? Okay. Sure. I think the, the most common reason in academia in the UK and uh, higher education system, the most common reason to move universities is because you want to access a promotion that you didn't get at your initial university or if there are budget limitations in some way. I think people tend to stay for longer still at universities because you also invest a lot in learning the institution, learning in specific ways, creating your own space. So I think shifting universities will always take time. Like going from a university to, to another will mean that you need to relearn a lot of the processes and procedures of that university. You might need to align either your research or your teaching. For instance, I have recently joined a new university. My previous university, my previous university had a um, strong focus on the translation professional, translation for business, and this more applied and employable angle to translation. While my current university has a very strong tradition in cultural studies and modern languages, which brings a different view on languages and the professions in translation. What Warwick wants to do now is to strengthen that link with the industry and to create or to strengthen that employability angle as well. But it's a different context. And I, I, it, for me, it's very clear to see that the way how these two institutions work and how they approach university education is very different. And that will take time, obviously, and that will take some adjustment. So I think you need to be conscious of that. So I wouldn't say it's hard, but it does take time. And it does take um, some determination to some willingness to understand how systems work and how you can improve based on whatever is there, because you will always be building on top of that infrastructure. So you need to understand it first. So I think changes are not so common as in the industry, but they, they can be equally demanding. Okay. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. And uh, uh, talking about uh, research, uh, normally uh, apart from uh, teaching at the university and, you know, uh, designing your own courses based on the curricula of the university. Could you maybe briefly describe uh, how does your look, how does your day look like as a, as an assistant professor, as a researcher? What do you normally do apart from just teaching to, to students? 
Well, I think teaching is probably the the part that takes the least time. I I think, and this is probably something similar to in the industry, most of what we do now is just emailing because everything involves just looking at your email and contacting people. Uh, A lot of my research is done as part of international teams. So I collaborate with colleagues still in Warsaw, in South Africa, in Australia. So a lot of my time goes into coordinating these projects and to try to make plans and try to reach agreements and funding applications. So a lot of my time also goes into preparing publications and preparing funding applications. Uh, at work in particular, I'm responsible for maintaining the, the or organizing research seminars, but also the professional talks. So I talk a lot with industry representatives to create agreements, to invite them to give lectures to and guest lectures to our students to share their views so a a lot of that management work i think uh, takes priority in many senses on what we do right now and i think that's part of this push to bring academia and the industry together closer together in a way and yeah i think that's that's primarily that's primarily it. It involves also some supervision and working with colleagues, developing new modules, as you mentioned, and a lot of more, especially now that I have more experience, a lot of thinking about where we want to go as a program and how to how to recruit students, I think, for the univer- for the UK university system. That's also very important. Yeah. Yeah, I really like how you you made a connection between how you stay in touch with the industry also, because that's one of the the thoughts that the university and industry are not that close enough. But I really like the fact that, uh, as you mentioned, you get involved in creating different initiatives or talks or uh, projects that do have a social impact and that you try to stay in contact, you do your best to stay in contact with the industry and share experiences from, from one field into the other. So I think that this is also one uh, practical aspect of on how you prepare your students for the professional life in case they want to join the industry. They already have contact with professionals, with colleagues from the industry. And Yeah, exactly. I, I think we need to revise that view that universities are completely isolated from the industry. I think many of us are really trying to do our best to create these connections and to create channels of communication that benefit our students because we recognize that we we can offer a foundation for a career in the language industries, but the language industries are so diverse and offer so many opportunities that we cannot cover anything. So we, everything, sorry. So we need to give students the tools to integrate into that industry and to, to find their own paths in into the industry. And the only way we can do that is by strengthening those links. And I think we're coming to the, um, we're, we are in a position where we provide a good platform for our students to do that. Yeah, yeah, that's very, that's right. And I, I feel that more and more often industry and uh, and academia are, are more connected and there are a lot of initiatives either online or even face-to-face events that try to bring together and even share different results from research, research done in the academia and how it can impact the the industry or even agreements and um, combined research activities done between both of them, right? Exactly. So we, well, I work on more of my fields of expertise around the visual translation and translation technologies. And I think those are very good examples of how we're coming together. We, in audiovisual translation conferences, we often have representatives from the industry. We also work close together with companies that develop software for for professional translators because what well, they are interested in more people adopting their software and we are interested in ensuring that our students have access to that software so something that I've done at work is signing agreements with uh, to Academy and Happy Scribe for instance to ensure that our students have access to professional software we have recently also joined the MA collaborative program of the Association for Translation Companies, which is an initiative in which master students can, within which master students can develop a master's dissertation that is going to be useful for the Association of Translation Companies. And that's an opportunity for students to work specifically 
in collaboration with these associations. And for us, it's a good way of staying relevant and to contribute to the transfer of knowledge. So there are many initiatives like this. Elia is also working quite a lot on this, uh, on bridging this gap. Although I, I don't want to say gap because I think we're, it's not a gap anymore. We are creating uh, plenty of bridges there. So there are many ways of doing this. And I think there is a lot of potential there. The thing is, we cannot cover all the bases, all of us, because the, as I said, it's a very diverse industry. So there will always be uh, someone who studied specialized translation, but will end up being a project manager or an audiovisual translator. And obviously there will be a, a perceived gap there. But I think as long as we give future graduates the tools to integrate into any sector of the industry, that is um, a successful story for us as trainers or from the industry as as in general yeah i love that I, I really love what you what you said and you highlighted everything so well and um, i would have another question regarding the academia how difficult is it to get published or you know how do you circulate the results of your research or in terms of academic publications, I think we have many journals right now and many good quality journals as well. And I would encourage early career researchers to really publish while they are doing their PhD because that's a way of accessing additional feedback. Something that many journals are trying to do, I think, is recognizing the role that they play in training future researchers. So something that I do as an editor and as a reviewer is encouraging or providing feedback that will really be actionable, that people, especially early career researchers, will be able to use to improve the writing. But we need to recognize that that's a very limited space that we, you know, that, or that we interact with in the professional, in the academic world, like journal publications. So for early career researchers, I think platforms as, such as Twitter or LinkedIn are also essential to disseminate results, like just publishing executive summaries of research or just quick notes on you know, websites like The Conversation or even just having a blog and sharing that information on Twitter can really have huge impact. Nowadays, we have podcasts such as this one uh, where you can also communicate your findings. So I think it's important to recognize that we talk to many different audiences and that we will need to open up different channels of communication with those audiences. And I think there's a lot of value on that. And founders are recognizing that we need to communicate to a general audience. So that needs to be part of our communication strategy more broadly. Yes, exactly. And sometimes even you might end up with different partnerships with other universities that are interested in the same topic or, you know, have a joint research um, proposal. Exactly. And Twitter, for instance, is great for that. And well, we all know that there are many changes on the platform at the moment, but for me, Twitter has been essential to consolidate in an international network and to gain some visibility and just reaching out to people and say, oh, you're working on this, maybe we should do that together or uh, to also gain some visibility in the industry because that's where the, that's the common place, the, the marketplace for all of us really. And it, I think for that, Twitter is really good. Yeah, definitely. Social media is, is an essential part of our daily lives. That, that's yeah. for sure. And sharing is more than ever a, a fundamental tool to, to find out what everyone is, is working on. And um, now that we have gone through your academic and professional journey, uh, if we look back to your experience, would you be able to mention which were the turning points turning moments in your in your professional experience and what were the strategies that you adopted in order to you know overcome them and what would be your main takeaways your lessons learned what would you do differently or what advice would you give to someone not being uh, very not having a clear decision whether to start a phd to continue the professional journey in the the professional career in the academia so just providing some conclusions for, for our audience. Of course. So I think the main thing is maintain your uh, options open. And we've mentioned that before, do network on all fronts and in all spaces, do make friends, reach out to people, establish connections. I think especially 
early on in my career that has been one of the highlights, maintaining those links and nurturing those links because they have led to really realistic and opportunities that have materialized. Uh, and it's basically just reaching out to people and maintaining communication, open lines of communication with them. I think that has been essential. Through my PhD, I know that PhD experiences can be very daunting and demanding and stressful to people. And I think it's important to think about your PhD as a job. And uh, ideally as a job that you do nine to five and that's part of your life, but that it's not gonna define you as a person. I think there are many issues of identity when it comes to doing a PhD, because after four or five years of really focusing on that one project, it might seem that that is your life and that is not the reality. I mean, that's part of your life and it's probably a big part of it, but it's not all. And going into the industry or moving from the industry to academia is going to be a big change, but it shouldn't be seen as a failure. I think we need to be more open about how we can move across these different sectors because they're part of the same industry or the same market. Uh, so I think... I would recommend that people look at, at it as a uh, look at a PhD as a job, as a regular job, and really focus on skills rather than uh, roles or titles. What do you need to do? What what can you do? And how do those skills prepare you for your life? I think we are seeing that in the marketplace, you're talking more and more about skills rather than job titles or specific roles. And I think that's a way to go because at the end of the day, most translators, what they do is basically documentation, terminology management, time management, and those are the ta the skills that you will need on many other roles. So see how you can you how you can easily transfer those skills to other areas, and think broadly about what you can do as a as a career because there are many different opportunities. It's a very vibrant industry, and I think that's the that's the advantage that we have, and we have the same in academia as well. There are many different opportunities for people opening up. Again, it's a competitive market and I think it's realistic to consider that there are limitations to the opportunities that you could find in academia. But So maintaining that flexibility in thinking and maintain, staying open to the possibility of moving from academia to the industry and the other way around, that's gonna be very beneficial for, for future academics or professionals. Yes, definitely. Definitely. I, I really love the, the conclusion and the takeaways. It's very important to stay connected with with the people in the industry you want to work or get in touch. And I think that nowadays it's easier than maybe it was a decade ago, you know, I, to make the switch either from the industry to the academia and vice versa, and especially because of the social media as well, right? Because we have access to a lot of information and you can access people. Absolutely. I think the challenge now is that the pace seems to be too fast and I think it's difficult to keep abreast of all the information that's coming up and to feel that you are on top. But using those resources wisely and really taking advantage of that interconnectivity and that exposure and that agility, I think it's essential to, to develop a career that you're happy with. And I think that's the main goal. Try to find a job that gives you something that motivates you to to get up every morning it doesn't have to be your life and that's important but i don't think people should be suffering through uh, their day-to-day -day lives just because of a of a job there are many opportunities out there exactly and i i would have one one more question as a an assistant professor are you also invited in the uh, in the industry to you know provide um maybe share your experience from what you're doing in the in the academia? Because I know that it's it's quite normal to have this trend of having professionals from the industry uh, going to give guest lecturers to the, to the students. But what about the other way around? Well, recently I did a podcast for one of this, um, for, well, it's later, I think I can mention it, one of the leading uh, media research outlets in the industry. And that was very interesting because it really opens up other potential channels of communication. And I have had experiences of talking to mostly associations of professional translators. I think there are some companies that are also opening up opportunities for collaboration. But I think when it comes to the, 
development of products or things like that, time limitations and um, agreements might take might complicate the situation. But there are spaces such as this this podcast or talks to professional associations that definitely create that that possibility to talk to people on the other side of the industry. And that's that's definitely an advantage, I find. Yes, definitely. The bridge has <laughs> to to pass, right? From exactly. the industry to the academia and the, the other way around. It's, it's the fear. The... That's a good point. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, thank you for sharing all the experiences. And uh, just to sum up for, for the audience and everyone who's looking or watching us, is there anything that you would like to tell us? What's, you know... Uh, the thing that you maybe most enjoy in in your career by working in the in the academia i think the flexibility of working along the lines and on the topics that i like and enjoy i think it has been every experience in my academic career has kind of tweaked a bit my focus to translation like going to south africa i really expanded my views on multilingualism and language in society Working at Aston University allowed me to see that connection between academia and the industry from a from a closer, more central position. And working now at work, I'm also having the opportunity to influence how we evolve our program and how we redesign what we want to do or define what we want to do as an institution. And that, that on the one side and on the on the one hand and on the other hand. I think I mentioned people and networking already, but really gaining access to different communities of colleagues that have become my, my friends, basically. I think that has been a very nurturing experience. And I really enjoy doing what I do. And something I didn't mention before, but I think I, I would like to, to emphasize anyway, is the fact that my, my role right now allows me to balance my, to have a work-life balance and to be... It empowers me to really make those decisions. And I think uh, in this day and age, it's important to have a job that allows you to basically explore your dif the different uh, layers of your life and develop your life. And uh, I don't, I, I have very specific rules. I don't, I take holidays every year. I take weekends off. So I know that it can be a very demanding environment, but my role right now allows me to create some barriers and to decide well this is what i do for for my job and this is what i do for my regular life and i'm going to spend time with my friends and i think that's quite a quite a good uh, things to think to have right now when it comes to to the job market yeah i really like that you pointed out this uh, life work life balance because it's really important and well-being is uh, a trending topic right you know, on taking care of ourselves. It's not only having a job, but rather enjoying and, you know, having the limits of when you feel you're close to a burnout, for example, know how to how to cope with it. And in the academia, talking about burnout, because this is also a topic that is is recurrent in, in the industry and in the corporate environment. In the in the academia, do you feel that you have a lot of pressure, for example, in meeting certain requirements, like, for example, public uh, having to publish uh, several articles per year in different uh, journals, international journals. How do you feel? Is there a pressure in in your in the academia? There can be, and I think I don't want to. I mean, when I talk about well-being and mental health, I'm talking about my own position. I know that there are many different stories depending on the institution, depending on the higher education system, and I don't want to romanticize this idea that we in academia are all fine. On the contrary, we are right now actually going through a huge strike action in the UK, demanding uh, fair working conditions, uh, demanding that employers look into solving issues of um, pay gaps due to race, gender, and all these issues. So it's, there are many issues in academia, but I think it allows you to, or some of it, and I'm talking here from a very privileged position of someone who has a full-time job, at a good um, at a university that allows me to make conscious decisions. So I know that this is not everyone else's uh, reality. Uh, so yes, there can be very demanding and very um, complicated realities in academia that we need to face. 
And I think that's the same in the industry. There are better and worse companies. So we, we do need to take that into account. But I think to some extent, you know, some universities do allow you to make conscious decisions and do uh, give you space to look into your mental health. So if you're in a space that doesn't allow that for you, I think it's important to consider uh, the pros and cons of wherever you are. And again, I'm here talking from a very privileged position, so I don't want to create additional burden for, for people. But yeah, it, it could be um, a demanding and a, a taxing space as well. And when you decide to, how do you decide what kind of subjects do you want to teach? Is this something that you, you have the option to select it yourself? Or is it that you are just given the, the name of the subjects that you, you have to teach? How is it? We are, uh, actually, this is the first year I was teaching a module on subtitling, and I'm very happy to have developed that one. And we are developing new modules on translation technologies, which I also suggested and they were approved. So right now, where I am, I can design modules and uh, modules that are related to my own research areas of interest. In terms of my research, I have always been able to choose my own topics and the focus uh, that I want to follow in my projects. I, regarding publications, I have also maintained a good uh, publication trajectory, which uh, has been good. But again, um, I know that there are peop some other people face other limitations and that could be a problem. But I have been lucky enough to be in a position where I can choose uh, or opt to teach modules that are close to my interest and to do the research that I want to do. Yeah, that's the ideal scenario, right? Because that's what you're passionate about and that's where you will, you know, it will be easier for you to, to develop any initiatives or write uh, research. And I, the reason why I was asking this is because in the industry, sometimes you apply for a job position, you get that one, and then all of a sudden you discover that maybe you no longer want to be a translator, an in-house translator, but you discover that you like project management so that you can sh you can shift from one department to another. So that's why I wanted to know in the academia whether you have the chance, you know, to, to choose how flexible there the situation is. But I think that, as you all say, the, at least in your situation, you have a privileged situation where you can even develop and design uh, your own modules. And also, I suppose that that's where, again, we talk about this bridge. You are uh, aware of everything that's happening in the industry and you try to incorporate or get this link with the industry in order to prepare your students. And at the same time, stay uh, stay uh, updated to what's happening in the industry, right? Exactly. And I think it's also important to consider that we, when you are putting together a master's program or an undergraduate program, you have different people involved. So many different people will have different interests. So I teach subtitling and other visual translation at the moment, but some other colleagues teach research methods and translation theory, and they're generally interested in that as well. So this is more of... I think it's a matter of looking at this as a collaborative effort where we all have the opportunity to teach what we want. And then we, you can also always implement co-teaching and things, strategies like that to support each other and to accompany each other through these um, different scenarios. Yeah, that's great. So thank you so much, David, for your time and for sharing everything with us. I think it's, it's really important, you know, to give visibility on how you operate on in the in, in the academia because sometimes uh, from the industry side it's like oh they are at the university we don't know exactly how it is but I think that the perspective you gave us um, regarding how to treat a PhD uh, I think it's very useful for people doubting uh, and for sure they will get some clarity with with your experience on how to treat a PhD as you all said as as a job and if you in the end, finish your PhD, but you don't want or cannot get a job in the academia, don't don't look at it as a failure. That's really important, you know, on the mindset that we have and how we really perceive what we do. And especially, you know, the, the skills and requirements on how to prepare for an interview in the academia, that was really, I think, the part where there's no not much visibility in the, in the industry, I would say. But I think that the most important takeaways I... I take from you is uh, staying connected, the network uh, opportunities from both sides, industry and academia. I think it's important to think that the movement can, can happen both ways. 
And in the same way that I'm now providing some insights into the academic world, I, I would benefit a lot from listening to people in the industry to see how they feel and what they, uh, to hear about what they do. So yeah, no, it's a pleasure to share all this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, David. And we keep in touch. Thanks. I invite you to follow us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all other major platforms. Subscribe, but also share it with persons who might find it useful.